take it away. Absolutely. Hi. So, uh, hi, welcome, Peter. Uh, today, Peter's going to be talking uh, to us about uh, data cubes and how they can be used to uh, enable space time analytics and AI. So, I'm definitely interested in uh, this. I've uh, worked uh, with a lot of um, big data uh, myself, and we've uh, you know used the Hadoop ecosystem. Most of my work has been with um, you know uh, moving things moving through space and time, and so it's always good to hear about um, more of the imagery side of things or um, just other ways of thinking about things. So uh, thanks for joining us, Peter, and uh, take it away. Hello, thank you very much for this warm welcome. Apologies for the delay, and you can feel immediately where that comes from. I'm sitting here at a trade fair, and it's an interesting environment, not the least the internet connection. It's funny, but internet is not what we are expecting in the 21st century. Uh, also, uh, because this background is a little bit noisy and uh, maybe not exactly fitting, uh, I guess I will switch off uh, camera later on. Anyway, we want to look at the slides. So let's go into the next endeavor. And I will see how I can do screen sharing. Uh, is there anything um, you need to enable me to do? Uh, no, you should have uh, access to controls that will uh, what you screen share. Um, I think we're seeing the same thing. I've got a little uh, monitor that has a red slash through it. If I click on that, that would bring up a dialogue where I could select. Uh, ah, share. that's it. Okay, got it. Wonderful. And that works. We see the famous look into infinity, which always Indeed. tells me that, yes, we are connected visually. Okay, then let me switch over into no, not this one. Hey, why don't we start with slide one? Would make sense, wouldn't it? So here we are uh, with the presentation, and I hope you can see it as well. Let's move ahead. So, data cubes. Uh, I guess we know them. Actually, we know them from OLAP and business data, uh, but geo. Well, that's relatively recent that it, the concept has gained traction, although it was around for quite some time. But hey, let's face it, geodata in the end are multidimensional. Yes, we've grown up with two maps as a symbolized picture of the Earth surface. But in the end, today we are further. We collect data on various height and depth levels, and we collect data over time. So actually, such data are multidimensional indeed. And if space and time, so X, Y, Z, and T is not enough, then let us add further abstract dimensions, like, for example, uh, spectral bands in hyperspectral images or some geostatistical dimensions. So we have a nice cute universe that is by far not just three-dimensional, as the term cubes may suggest, but actually it's multidimensional. Okay, so uh, that part about the dimensions. Then the next aspect is actually uh, many, if not most of the data, at least in terms of volume, that reach us about planet Earth, they are observed either, so coming from some sensors, or they are generated, say, from some simulations like weather forecast. So, naturally, they come discretized, they come gridded, or as what we call raster data. That doesn't mean that these data are uniformly spaced so that we have regular grids only. We very often have irregular grids and actually in our practice we often see a mix of both. So for example you have ortho images with a regular spacing in light and long but an irregular spacing in time which has to do with the uh, satellite trajectories and others. Good, so we have these data and they have a clear conceptual model. How do we want to expose that to users? One alternative is, it has long been done like that. We just have zillions of files and that generates, or that is a sensor-centric view that says, okay, I get a file from the satellite. 
I do some magical processing and then I store exactly that file. Uh, that can look as beautiful as you can see it on the left hand side and this is a major reason why it's only for experts. You have to be simultaneously in, an expert in IT, in remote sensing and uh, maybe in some programming language like Python. Another option is we just pull them together into some logical view that makes it appear as a cube. That means I can walk seamlessly through space and time. I don't need to think about file boundaries. I don't need to think about homogenization because it's all been done for me. And so instead of the zillions of files, I have one data cube per sensor. So one for, uh, let us say, line Z8 and one for Sentinel-2 and one for Sentinel-5P and so on. This definitely is more user-centric because in the end it more closely reflects how we understand these data. That is values, colors possibly, sitting somewhere in space and time. So actually the second one is gaining more and more traction and I find it the more attractive one. It makes life simpler, not only for humans, also for machines, because the programs now don't need to think about this bread and butter business of how do I juggle the files and how do I get around uh, reading the next file in time and not multiple times. So that all is happening somehow magically. Of course, not magically. It needs to be done by some piece of software. But now we have a separation of concerns. There is one piece of software which generates the data cube view and there is the other piece of software that does whatever we want and that second piece of software can concentrate on its purpose. And that definitely makes the code more lightweight, better to understand and maintain. In short, better to do. Okay, of course that requires some work. Data cubes don't come uh, for free. Actually, they need some homogenization work from various perspective. Uh, think about radiometrical correction. Uh, pictures have different uh, color and intensity at the same point at different times. Uh, we need to do the geometric correction and whatnot. How has that been done in the past? Well, it's been with users. So whenever you wanted to use these files, you had to do that yourself. That task now increasingly is pushed back to the data providers. And that means that the data providers now have to offer such data in a homogenized way that makes it easier to analyze, analyze them, to visualize them, to do data fusion, etc. And that makes sense. I mean, they know their data best, at least they should. They have good resources available and why not do it just once and for all? So that is the task that needs to be done. And then due to the multidimensional nature of this concept data cube, actually we can work across the dimensions with the same mechanisms. So one dimensional sensor data, two dimensional images, three dimensional image time series, four dimensional simulation output like weather data or general statistics data. They all can be treated with the same mechanisms and in particular, they can be combined. So uh, we have whole new opportunities of dealing with the data in an easier way. And we push that tasks of accomplishing that functionality and these interfaces into dedicated components, which by the way, as a footnote, follows more this Unix principle of have, having building blocks of functionality where one command or one utility does a particular job only and does it well. Okay, so gradually as this concept has arrived in the earth sciences, actually uh, now there are many research labs and also companies underway supporting that. The concept as such is old. 
So uh, we had our first papers, the first one actually back 1991, but then in OLAP, Online Analytical Processing, we find Business and Statistics Data Cube, starting with Inman's Seminal Publication 92. And so the concept as such is available, but I hasten to say, of course, OLAP Data Cubes are not exactly what we need here in the Earth Sciences, for various reasons, starting with the density of data. But that's a different topic. Let's not get lost. Uh, actually, classifications have been done. Uh, there are various around, also conceptual papers comparing theoretical uh, fundaments. Uh, but if we address that from a more practical perspective, we find mostly three different approaches to offer data cube functionality. There is the concept of array databases. So we have a real database management system, including, including query language and storage management that focuses on multidimensional array, which is the data structure underlying the grids. Uh, then we have libraries that give you pieces of functionality that can be invoked from some other program. So programming, application programming interfaces, or programming tools uh, that, uh, for example, offer you some um, command line interface. There is a large number of them. Uh, very often, but not always, they are based today on the X-Array library, which is a Python library for handling arrays in main memory. Okay, and then, of course, uh, we still have around the MapReduce type systems. So there is Hadoop and Spark, mostly. And based on them, some array support has been implemented. MapReduce does not naturally support that. And neither, Spar uh, neither Java nor uh, Scala have support for large arrays. Uh, but it can be built, of course. And so libraries have been built that extend the MapReduce concept. And so you find systems like Sci-Hadoop, GeoTrellis, etc. But actually, I wanted to avoid going into the details. Of course, if you are interested, then ask me. And by the way, uh, why not interrupt right away when you have questions? Another option, of course, is let's do that in the end. If you want to have an in-depth comparison, Research Data Alliance has published a report where 19 tools are compared in their functionality. Uh, so this is multi-pages and four of them have undergone a benchmark that is published on GitHub. Here below is the link. If you want to get the slides, by the way, so that you don't have to type this link now, just let me know and I will gladly uh, provide that publicly or, uh, well, on specifically, uh, specific emails. Rasterman, uh, just to have um, advertisement slide here, is our approach to it. It's a array database system. So it follows the approach of offering query language access. Uh, by the way, uh, the original query language meantime is part of the ISO SQL standard under the headline of MDA for multidimensional arrays. Uh, and that database engine is a full stack implementation that is an operation on massive amounts. That is dozens of petabyte. Uh, but uh, let's keep it with that and move forward because I just wanted to mention another thing that is the Earth Server Data Cube Federation, where we actually have several providers and a growing number of providers that come together to provide their data cube offerings in an integrated way. Integrate meaning that it's location transparent, users see one big space of data cubes that can be queried where uh, data fusion can be done and the whole thing completely free of any coding. Okay, but hey, let's abstract away from the concrete tools and talk about the standards involved. Actually, there is a suite of standards available. And as I will want to point out, this is actually agreed across several bodies, which is good news for tool implementers and for users alike. 
Um, okay, let me start with something. Uh, do you like standards? I've often heard the criticism, bah, they take away my creativity. They are just blocking me, they are blocking creativity, they are blocking innovation. Like this year. Isn't it a nice bike? So, yeah, it looks good to me, definitely. So building such a thing is really artistry. And you can bring in your inventiveness and build your very own custom bike. But wait a moment. Do you really want to build it from scratch? I mean, do you want to start cooking your own rubber now and uh, build your tires? Do you want to do something like light bulbs for yourself? And chances are that you really cannot do the engine yourself. You have to use something that's existing. Hmm. Okay. So if you use existing tools, they should match somehow, right? Now, you will want to go shopping. So you go to the shop next door and you find something or you don't find it. Maybe not the right thing. Maybe it's not your taste. Maybe it's too expensive, whatever. Okay, then you go to the next shop. And ultimately, you can find what you want, thanks to the help of standards. So the standards, actually, if they are well-crafted, they don't block your creativity, but quite the opposite. They enable your creativity because they allow to plug things together and do your own thing that makes up your very special service, uh, I mean, custom bike. And that's the same thing with OGC. People were clever enough in the beginning to not develop the one single monolithic standard, but from the beginning to invest into modularity. I say invest because I can tell you, it's hard discussions with lots of opinions, lots of conflicting opinions, different approaches, different ideas. So it's hard work to find out those concepts that carry and get to the compromises. But then you have a modular suite of building blocks, each serving particular purposes that you can combine. So for example, you can combine today a catalog service with a web map service, with a web feature service, with a web coverage service. Okay, again, let's not get lost. Mentioning all of that, uh, here they are. And I'm heading for something particular for the web coverage service. This is why it's in the center. Uh, actually, there are some friends and neighbors around. A web feature service gives you feature data. A catalog gives you catalog data. Okay. And then we have something exotic in the middle. That is the maps, web map service. The decisive difference is that uh, WFS, WCS give you data. That is something you can con continue working with. Web map service is always at the end of a pipeline directed at humans. Look at the little picture bottom left. That is a terrain model that has been hate colored. That is WMS, that is good for humans. That is not good for a GIS, obviously. You cannot process that further. Okay, and therefore we have WFS and WCS. People sometimes complain, why is there no nice visual client for a web coverage service? Well, because it delivers data that want to be piped into some other tool. WCS is well suited for being in the middle of a tool chain. Okay, so here is something <clears throat> uh, that shows you the picture specifically about the coverages. And uh, that is something that is being discussed this way in ISO, but is always in close correlation with OGC. Okay, here's a new word, coverage. You may or may not be familiar with that. Actually, it is a common principle that unifies uh, regular and irregular grids. That's our raster data. And point clouds and meshes. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so the coverage is the common data structure under which we find the gridded data or the data cubes. Now, there are several standards uh, in place and they are synchronized, as I mentioned, between OGC and ISO. I will proceed explaining them from bottom left. This is not corresponding to the sequence in time. 
So they have been done at different times. For example, uh, OGC coverage implementation schema CIS uh, was the first one, uh, got adopted as 19.123-2 by ISO. And only now we are finalizing dash one, etc. But doesn't matter, they are all synced well and they fit together. So first of all, we need to introduce terminology. What is a coverage? What is a grid? What is a direct position in the coverage? Uh, what do the cell values mean, etc.? That is in the coverage fundamentals, which is uh, originally 19123 of ISO, but that is old and outdated. And so it's being revamped. And this is becoming 19123-1. And OGC has already signaled that they are interesting then to consider that as the new abstract topic six, which is already existing with, IS, uh, with OGC. So an update. This defines the abstract concepts. This is not an interoperable definition of data structures. That comes with the next level. That is the coverage implementation schema with a name tentatively taken to exactly indicate, yes, this is something you can implement. This is something that you can test for compliance. And therefore we like to, or I like to call that concrete as the opposite of the abstract level. Okay, uh, this is still encoding independent. So you can find CIS uh, encodings in GeoTIFF, in NetCDF, in JPEG 2000 and so on. Uh, so we have a nice basis for shifting around boxes that contain coverages. That's the data model part. Currently or recently interest has started to also think about the processing model part in ISO. There are already services in OGC. I'll come to that in a moment. <clears throat> but again, from top to bottom. So there is work underway to develop 19.123-3 as the coverage processing fundamentals. Once again, the idea is not to have a concrete service definition. Uh, the idea is not to establish uh, some new programming language or so but just to have a concept that allows you with some nice syntactic formulation to express the basics of how a coverage should be processed. Uh, the concrete services then can be expressed with that and that should ease, that's the idea, specification. If you can simply express in a few lines, one or two lines, what actually a particular service functionality should do. It could make the concrete service definitions more lightweight. That's an idea. So at some time in future, we could think about getting concrete coverage services also in ISO. Uh, it's very dear to me to emphasize, this is not currently planned yet, and there is no concrete idea how that should happen. So this is really future. In OGC, actually, we have something already. We have the web coverage service and under development is OAPI coverages. So there are possible candidates. But once again, no discussion has started yet on this. Okay, so this is this magic square of coverage data and processing models. And uh, it shows also the tight relationship between OGC and ISO in this field. By the way, in Europe, we have the INSPIRE initiative, which is a legal framework for um, spatial data infrastructure coherence, let us say. And this also is based now uh, de facto on the OGC standards, on the CIS data model, and on WCS and WCPS as a service model. Um, WCPS, I'll come to that later. First, let me mention there is also an other compartment of ISO where data cubes are considered, and that is the SQL corner. Yes, you're right. SQL knows about data cubes. This is part 15 of the standard, spells out multidimensional arrays, so SQL MDA. That is actually uh, the 
underlying query language uh, of the Rustaman uh, concepts that have been brought into ISO uh, with some adaptations, uh, syntactically mostly. Okay, and we have data cubes there as well. These, however, are not geodata cubes. They don't know about the semantics of space and time, and uh, therefore they can be used for anything. For example, human brain images or cosmological simulations. This just on the side. Okay, here is the status of them. So 19.1.2.3-1 is ready for ballot. We are just finalizing that for submission to the ISO Secretariat. Dash 2 is adopted. Uh, dash 3 also ready for ballot. And as I said, uh, this fourth compartment, no activity yet. Inspire is adopted and SQL MDA likewise is adopted. Okay, now I mentioned the web coverage service, uh, which is, uh, if you will, the most practical thing with services uh, from these four cells, this magic square that I've shown to you. Uh, actually, it's a modular suite following this modular approach of OGC, where we have a core and extensions. The idea is that the core gives you everything that is the very, very, very basic but nothing more. In this case, the functionality contained in the core is giving me access to spatial temporal coverages or subsets of these and give that to me in my favorite data format. So encoding on the fly, period. That's it. This subsetting actually can be subdivided into trimming or slicing. Trimming just reduces the footprint, but keeps the dimension. Like 2D cutout from a 2D coverage, 3D cutout from a 3D coverage. Slicing, on the other hand, reduces the dimensions. So you get a time slice from an image time series stack, or you get the history of a single pixel from an image time series data cube. All of these can be mixed. So that is the core. Extensions add further functionality facets. So uh, from something very simple like range subsetting, so band extraction up to analytics, and these are optional. The intention is that actually an implementation can start easy. We tentatively wanted to keep the barrier low so that as many tools as possible implement that. And so today you find a who's who of open source and proprietary services that support this. And then they can decide whether they want to go for some extension or not. Okay, and here now to my personal favorite, WCPS. This four letter word stands for Web Coverage Processing Service and it's a language actually that allows spatial temporal data cube analytics. Uh, that means you actually can work on the grids and you can extract, you can subsit and you can process, but in particular, you can build expressions of arbitrary complexity. Like with any query language, you can build expressions that uh, do some processing on the server. So all you ship is the query string and you get back results. Just to give you an impression, here is a small example. Let us assume that we have three Modi scenes, M1 to 3, and for each of them, we want to get the difference between red and the near infrared band, and please as TIFF files. So we would write what's in the yellow box. Uh, we do a for loop, binding $C to those three variables in turn, and in the return clause, we uh, specify the difference and the encoding. That is done pixel-wise for the whole image, like many image processing languages do that. And so we would get back three TIFF images. Maybe we are not interested in all of them. We want to do filtering on the server. Then we add a WHERE clause where we can establish a predicate on the data, by the way. In this case, for example, where the near infrared exceeds some threshold with at least one pixel, just for the fun of it. Okay, so in three lines, we have specified what the result should look like. 
And that is what we get back. This is not yet the complete service. This is just the language. There is, of course, the carrier protocol. You need to submit that somehow to the server using HTTPS, etc. Uh, but I leave that out for simplicity. Good. Now, let's have a look at that. And that is something which you can try it yourself, actually. So, uh, going to standards.rustaman.com or inspire.rustaman.com shows you those examples uh, which you can try out yourself and uh, where I will go through a few of them. To this end, I need to get back to uh, this one here. By the way, I wanted to switch off the camera, which also saves some bandwidth. You never know what you need it for. And so, typing into the browser standards.rustaman.com. This is actually a site that we established at some time to showcase the use of WCS. And uh, therefore, you can play with that through various situations in life. Okay. So, for example, you can go through several dimensions here. One, two, three, four dimensional coverages. So, if you go into that one, you would get uh, NASA Worldwind, which shows you some map, some temperature service. And now we can start slicing that. And gradually we see how winter is coming on the northern hemisphere. So, we are looking at some three dimensional thing x, y, and time. For four dimensions, we like to use Microsoft Cesium, because it can do something that you see now. Different height layers, which we can switch on and off. And hey, we suddenly discover that our object wasn't three-dimensional. In fact, it was a four-dimensional coverage. Now you can change, of course, the footprint here. And so this is all mapped internally to trimming and slicing operations which tells you one thing, with these queries underneath, uh, this is not meant as a user interface. Of course, people don't want to learn yet another query language on this planet, but it's a very convenient programming interface, uh, which allows you to submit uh, big tasks to the server and get back the results, just as you are doing with SQL application programming over the last decades already, for the last 50 years. Okay, and so you find uh, more stuff here, like, for example, dynamic visualization. Uh, that means WebGL helps us to do a three-dimensional rendering, which in this case combines two coverages, actually, a DEM, which we put into the alpha channel of a PNG, and then Sentinel, two visible bands, which we put into RGB. And then WebGL can decode that PNG and do this nice thingy here that we can manipulate in the browser. This is also coverage queries. You don't believe it? Okay. Let's set a few channels to zero to get a sunset scenario. And here we go. So this is really dynamically generated from coverages. This should underline that the coverage and coverage processing concepts are quite powerful. And so with that standard, you get nice interfaces uh, to the users. Okay. So, Peter, here uh, we've yes. got about two minutes left, and you did get a question in chat from Aswara uh, Prasad, who uh -huh. asks, uh, hi, Peter, do you have any uh, tips or tools to do data validation after the geospatial processing? Uh, first of all, I, ah, here it is. Okay, I'm sorry, I cannot see both. I'm here in wilderness and I have just one screen. <laughs> okay, so uh, tools for validation, um, no. Uh, we are busy in the field of data management and delivery and analytics, but uh, not for validation, also not for CalVal in the pre uh, import phase. So, unfortunately, not much I can contribute here. Okay, so uh, maybe we use that for a discussion. I just bring up, uh, while I bring up the other side I've mentioned. Uh, 
which actually uh, shows in particular one thing uh, which I would like to bring up and that is metadata because it shows about the extensibility. I tentatively fetch a coverage now in GML. Nobody would want that normally. You don't want to see that. It's just something for your browser or for your tool. But here in all that stuff you find the coverage metadata and in that you find the Inspire metadata with their proper namespace and that shows how you can embed metadata and carry them around with your coverage. The coverage will not know them, but it will duly transport them. And this is used, for example, in the Inspire standard to bring in those specific metadata of which you see part of that. Okay, but then actually in the 29, I see one minute is left and I should maybe take a deep breath for possibly more questions. Um. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think George may have had a quick question. Uh, if there are other folks who have questions, uh, now's a great time to put them in chat. Uh, I'll provide some information about our next speaker, uh, George. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, always a great talk. Always impressive to get the background as well as the demonstration. Hey, one of the things I have a question about is early on, you talked about the different um, kind of classes of uh, uh, array databases uh, versus um, uh, languages like XRA, uh, as well as um, there was right. a third one. Oh, the MapReduce, like we're going to have a talk uh, a little bit later here on Sedona. Uh, each of them are finding communities that uh, find them valuable. And, um, and, and so I'm wondering if for, for your purpose, for the array database, who is you know best suited? Why would you choose array databases in comparison to a MapReduced or an XRA solution? What is your sweet spot uh, for addressing array databases for you know coverages and geospatial? Data? Okay, uh, that's an excellent question. Thank you, uh, George. Actually, uh, we have investigated in that question when we started doing that ourselves we had developed the concept and then the question was okay and what architecture is best suited uh, we found out some limitations with the map reduce part number one it is not the most efficient thing to do use uh, java code and that is efficient but not super efficient we for example translate queries meantime directly into machine code uh, second, the parallelization regime of MapReduce is limited because all nodes need to do the same thing. And actually, uh, in an other approach where you do query splitting based on the query language, each node can do something individual and that enhances parallelism. Just uh, two examples. Uh, as compared to the libraries, uh, well, I'm coming from a database background, and maybe so I'm, I have a prejudice, but I like the idea to offer not a programming interface, but something more high level. And actually, we try even to abstract away from the query language uh, something. So with Python, you're bound to Python, and you have to be a Python programmer. Uh, think about way back in the 1970s, COBOL was the language of choice, and SQL was found to be better. So uh, that maybe illustrates my personal take on this. That's a great answer to a great question. And that's probably a good place to stop. Uh, so thank you very much, Peter, uh, for joining us from uh, you know, the floor of a trade show.